Good morning, everyone. Josh is severe weather. Well, we've got some quiet weather for the most part in the U.S., so we're going to go ahead and do our first stab here at the Atlantic hurricane season 2023. And here is the hurricane forecast. Now, last year was pretty average, but obviously Hurricane Ian and Nicole both impacted Florida. Hurricane Ian being the big monster that it was, it was a Category 5 that weakened slightly to a high-end Category 4 when it hit Southwest Florida. We ended up with 14 total storms. This year, I'm expecting kind of a similar season, but I don't think the details are going to be nearly the same. Uh, the areas that I am predicting to have the most activity by far are going to be the central Atlantic, where water temperatures are above average. But we do have some U.S. threats, and I'm mostly focused on the Florida region, but also up the East Coast into the mid-Atlantic for potential hurricane impacts. I'm expecting a total of 15 storms. That is just above the average of 14. Seven hurricanes, that's around average. Three major hurricanes, that is near to slightly above average. And uh, we may have an early season storm at some point, but I don't think it would be a major impactful storm. Uh, the majority of this is going to come during the height of hurricane season later July into early October. Now, let's take a look at the drivers here. And first, I'll show you the seasonal forecast from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, we are continuing that above average temperature forecast here over the southern and eastern United States. And that means, of course, the ocean waters surrounding the areas that we're targeting are going to remain above average. We're also predicting above average rainfall across the eastern United States um, with a, a mean trough uh, coming across the eastern United States. And obviously, the more rain you get with warmer temperatures, the more uh, that can impact the tropics. Now, one thing a lot of you have heard from me and from many of the other news outlets and other forecasters out there is that La Nina has come to an end. This is the El Nino ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. And you can see we were negative, which is the La Nina at the beginning of winter. Uh, but over the last two to three months, we've seen that La Nina come to an end and go into a more neutral phase. Uh, forecast models, uh, I'll show you in a little bit, but show that change continuing here into the summer and fall. Now, typically speaking, when you have an El Nino, which is what the prediction is going to be by the summer, we typically see fewer hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin, and that is due to stronger vertical wind shear. That same wind shear that is feeding into the tornado outbreaks we've seen this uh, spring so far is going to come into play as well farther south across the tropical season. Uh, so that is working against the threat to have strong hurricanes. However, it does not mean we won't have any hurricanes. I'm going to show you some analog years that are stacking up to similar to what we've had now and show you that uh, even if it means fewer hurricanes than the strong La Nina in 2020 when we had 30 storms doesn't mean there cannot be one big hurricane. And in my uh, opinion, I think there'll be at least one, probably up to as many as three major hurricanes. It also means we're going to have uh, a greater chance to see stronger hurricanes across the Pacific Basin. And um, also, of course, it means warm and wet. And I think that's especially going to be the case here in the uh, in South America, especially Peru and uh, Ecuador and southern parts of Colombia, we could have some potentially major impacts heading into the winter season here on the uh, <clears throat> upper west coast of South America. Now, here is kind of the last 12 years, and the red colors are La Nina, the green, or I'm sorry, El Nino, and the blue colors are La Nina. And the one thing that sticks out to you the most is that we've had La Nina over more than the last two and a half years, pretty much the entire way, kind of a triple dip. And it is at its most intense, typically speaking, in the winter times. This is January, uh, December, January, February, and you can see the numbers are at their most negative. Now, the La Nina actually strengthened very fast during the fall of 2020, and that's why we had such a record season. Uh, the last two years, it was still pretty negative. However, uh, because of the fact that we had uh, such, a, such amount of cooling here in the Pacific, it actually allowed the Atlantic waters to get almost too warm for their own good and caused a lot of dry Saharan air to uh, basically kill off storms uh, most of last July, most of last August. But that didn't, of course, rule out Hurricane Ian and then Hurricane Nicole impacting Florida kind of later in the tropical season in the La Nina. So definitely those warmer waters did come into play. Now, the years that came out of La Nina and went into an El Nino, I'm going to show you are 2018, which was a very busy year. Uh, especially in Florida and North Carolina, as well as uh, we saw that in kind of 2014, where we had kind of a weaker La Nina go into an El Nino. So basically the last two uh, tropical seasons that we went into an El Nino by the fall were 2018 and 2014. Those were two very different seasons. 
Uh, I'm going to show you the forecast here. This is our model plume showing uh, when we see these positive numbers, this is the zero degree line. We see positive that, of course, trends towards an El Nino. Uh, right now, the models are showing that we're going to be staying kind of more in a neutral phase or a very weak El Nino. Uh, but as we get to July, August and September, the heart of Atlantic hurricane season, there's pretty good agreement that uh, an El Nino would form. Some would even say a stronger El Nino, which could be a problem here in the winter time. Uh, but at the very least, uh, we will uh, solidify an El Nino by September, according to the majority of our uh, models. This is just a plume that shows all the potential solutions and um, they all head in that direction. Does that mean we're not gonna have a busy tropical season? Not necessarily. Now, 2014 was not a busy season. We had kind of a weaker El Nino or a weaker La Nina heading into an, a weaker La Nina. We did have some impactful storms, but mostly they stayed off the coast. Uh, you'll notice the Gulf of Mexico, though, was very quiet in 2014. We did have a Category 2 Hurricane Arthur that hit early in July. When people weren't quite ready for it to be a big season, we did have um, a disruptive hurricane. It wasn't a disastrous hurricane, but a disruptive hurricane for the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And then a strong hurricane, uh, which formed here south and east of Bermuda. Now, these are the areas I'm still focusing on for this year, the Central Atlantic and the East Coast. Now, 2018, much different story. We came out of La Nina and went into an El Nino, but that did not stop things. We had a near to above average season, <clears throat> but that was our last Category 5 to hit the United States, Hurricane Michael, which hit in October of 2018. So the waters were warm leading up to that event, despite the fact that we were in El Nino. So you can't just take uh, El Nino, throw it on the map and say we're not going to have a busy hurricane season. I think this season is going to maybe look like uh, – a blend between those two where it is going to be a, a slightly busier than average season, but we are going to have southeast threats across the panhandle of Florida and the east coast. But more of our storms will be less significant with potentially a big storm somewhere in the central Atlantic that stays east of Bermuda. But Florida, North Carolina, up the east coast, those are the areas that I'm going to be watching. And here's why. From tropicaltidbits.com, you guys can see uh, much of the Atlantic Basin is above average uh, temperature wise, and it's not going to just become below average when we go into an El Nino this summer and fall. It's going to take a while to remove that warmth, especially with, uh, with, a, with a warmer than average spring and summer expected here in the southeast. Uh, you can see the warming, though, off of the Ecuador and Peru coastline here. This is where the La Nina has been getting wiped out over the last four months. It's already transitioned there. It is still slightly below average over the central tropical Pacific, or South Pacific, I should say. So we're not fully in an El Nino. We would need this entire region to have brighter, warmer colors. We're not there yet, but it looks like we are going to be transitioning in that direction over the beginning of summer and end of spring here. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to warm up the waters here over the eastern Pacific and continue to cool the Caribbean waters, but it's not going to happen overnight. This is a process that can take several months. You can see how incredibly warm the waters are over the central and eastern Gulf. Uh, we did have a little bit of a threat of maybe something subtropical forming and hitting the central Gulf Coast this week here. This is April 11th. Um, that chance looks like it's diminished just based on the fact that that low pressure system isn't really organizing as fast as it looked like it might. Doesn't mean there's not going to be rain and wind, though, of course, for the central Gulf. Gulf. Uh, but that's not a big storm. It's not going to cool the waters off, not like a major hurricane would. Uh, however, if you're in the Caribbean, this is some potential relief in that if we do have a system coming through here, it's less likely to intensify rapidly based on the fact that water temps are below average. However, a storm in the eastern Gulf or even the south central Gulf uh, or off the east coast does have a much better chance of intensifying rapidly. So if something does form and we get a break from the stronger wind shear that can accompany an El Nino, then we have to be very much prepared for quickly changing storms. And we saw that with Hurricane Ian. We saw that with Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Dorian, any of the big storms that were in this region over the last six tropical seasons. Uh, the forecast from weatherbell.com for the European seasonal shows that our water temps are going to remain above average. <clears throat> this is May, June, July, August, September, and October. And there's no strong cooling according to this model. It'll remain above average. I do think down in here we do have near to slightly below average temperatures, but notice how much warmer the Eastern Pacific is with respect to the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Atlantic. However, waters over the middle of the Atlantic remain above the average. So there's still gonna be fuel out there for any storm to intensify as it comes through this area. 
Uh, warm water does not necessarily mean a rapidly intensifying storm, but that is an ingredient that would help that process occur. Now, if we look at the uh, CANSIPS model, you actually see a little bit even more extreme here over the central Atlantic Ocean and certainly the Gulf. Um, these temperature of departures are two to three degrees or one to two degrees Celsius above average. So about four degrees above average Fahrenheit. The warmest waters, typically speaking, are late August into September. So tack on another degree or two above what it typically would be on average. And you still see that the fuel is there for above average water, despite the El Nino. The only thing the El Nino does is it enhances wind shear. And when you have stronger wind shear, um, you have less of a likelihood of storms surviving in that sheared environment. But does not mean we're gonna have strong wind shear throughout the entire summer and fall. Uh, there will be moments where we can have uh, a Rosby wave and uh, when we have uh, an MJO pulse that allows for more intense storms to get going. And uh, certainly it looks like that would be the case again. Now precipitation anomaly, as we head into the summer and into the tropical season, you can see that the Western and Southern Gulf and the Caribbean are predicted to have below average rainfall which is a good thing because last year it was so darn wet down in here. Now, the Eastern Gulf and the Western Atlantic, on the other hand, remain above average for rainfall. So maybe a good thing for Florida, which had such a warm and dry uh, fall and, and early spring and that we need the rain, but we could also have too much of a good thing um, as we certainly see the Western Atlantic remains wetter than average here right on through the heart of hurricane season, August, September, and October. So does not guarantee that we have strong hurricanes in here, but does mean we've got a higher likelihood of tropical systems based on what we're seeing here in the precipitation pattern. And where storms develop in the Sahel region of Africa, we have a much above average rainfall projected here for May, June, and July. Now, Cape Verde season goes towards July and August, um, but this is certainly setting the stage for what could be a more active storm track across the Eastern Atlantic. Uh, for those Cabo Verde storms to get going. We did not see this last July and August, but, um, or we did see it to some extent, but we saw uh, much drier than average uh, conditions over the Eastern Atlantic. I think that could tip a little bit though this year and something I'll be watching for you guys. And this is a zoomed in view of our current situation, well above average temperatures in the Gulf in the Western Atlantic. I should have put this earlier in the video. Now there's a somewhat controversial uh, controversial um, forecasting system called the uh, LEZAC recurring cycle. It does work out pretty well in many cases. It doesn't necessarily work out, but I did want to lead you to WESH TV showing uh, Eric Burris showed uh, kind of how it worked out last year, where storms were in Florida and how the cycle of storms uh, can recur over a certain period. Uh, this was the forecast from 2022 where the hot spots actually did work out across Florida and across the Carolina coast. And this was mainly two storms, so Ian and Nicole. Uh, now, according to Eric Burris, um, the hot spots are actually in pretty similar spots to what I showed you. And a lot of that is based on the uh, recurring cycle here that we see, according to meteorologist Gary Lezak from 2020weather.com. Um, it shows that the East Coast may potentially have a storm system at the end of May and beginning of June, as well as the middle of July and the early to mid part of September. Now, the first two I'm not super worried about because they're typically not in spots where you've got stronger hurricanes. However, the September 8th to 13th uh, would be a time where we have to be more concerned about a bigger storm based on the fact that that is right in the heart of hurricane season. The west coast of Florida um, may have a couple of smaller storms at some point here, even in May, an early season storm, and then towards the middle of July, and then right before Labor Day weekend, and obviously that is an area we have to watch. However, the cycle, when it repeats itself, it does not go out further. So later September and October, I would still be on high alert if you're on the West Coast of Florida and the Gulf Coast of Florida. For the Carolinas, we may see something forming here towards the middle of May, but more likely we see that early July storm. I showed you Arthur from 2014, that could repeat itself. And then at the end of August, we could also see a potential storm system 2018, we saw Florence, that was actually September, but uh, something like that could happen in August, and we may have to watch again in September and early October. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the Western Gulf. We do have to keep an eye on South Texas for something to form in the Gulf and track westward. We also have to track the Mid-Atlantic, but these two areas, according to the Lezak recurring cycle, are less likely to see a strong hurricane. They could see a hurricane, uh, but less likely to see a strong hurricane. And here you can see the WESH -ESH forecast 
pretty much in line with my forecast. They're going with a range. I'm going just above the average. Um, coming off the triple dip La Nina uh, indicating near average uh, conditions. So much more is going to change with this forecast. The hurricane season does not begin for another month and a half, but um, and now is the time to start getting ready for it. Um, it only takes one storm. And I don't say that to you know, throw it in your face and, and dumb it down, but really knowing that how things have worked in the past, we go back to 1992, Hurricane Andrew didn't happen until the end of August. That was the first storm, but it was a huge storm for Florida, Louisiana, and the Southeast. Uh, really, that is a sign that it only does take one storm. Ian last year was really the first impact we saw in the Southeast. That didn't come until the end of September. So uh, don't get caught sleeping on this hurricane season. It could still be active for you. And we definitely have that potential for a major hurricane to hit the Southeast. Thank you so much for your time today. If you could like this video, share with your friends and subscribe to my channel for more updates as we get closer to tropical season. Um, I will share extreme weather events, severe weather outbreaks, and any tropical threats to the United States or even the rest of the Atlantic or even the world for that matter. And I'll have Facebook updates for you as well. Facebook.com slash Josh's Severe WX. Thank you so much for your time. As always, I want to give all the glory to God uh, who allows me to do this. And um, it, it just means a lot for me to share that. I realize this is a science video. I'm talking about my faith, but it is important to me. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he has called me to do my best to prepare you for inclement weather, including hurricanes. I hope you stay prepared. If you have any prayer requests, I'm happy to pray over you, spoken or unspoken. And I appreciate your time today. God bless you and have a wonderful Tuesday. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care.